Any, any question from the audience? Yes, may I ask uh, Professor uh, Zinning to have uh, a comment or a short question to Florian Kretz? Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Dr. Nguyen, um, dear colleagues. Um, very interesting talk, um, Professor Kurtz. Um, I enjoyed it very much as we in the Winston's Hospital in Cologne already uh, started with a triclip as well and uh, did our first cases last year. Um, may I ask um, one question about um, the typical patient maybe suffering from mitral regurgitation on the one hand side and tricuspid regurgitation on the, on the other side? Is this Patients are recompensated after um, diuretic therapy. How do you proceed when you encounter, let's say, um, a moderate mitral regurgitation and a severe or massive tricuspid regurgitation? Would you go for mitral valve first or uh, directly go for the tricuspid valve? What's your experience? I would, in any case, um, assess invasive hemodynamics first. Um, um, for example, there are, there are patients with a, um, a functional MR, which um, upon exercise, which you can easily test in a right uh, heart catheter catheterization, um, which then uh, increase to a severe MR. Uh, or those patients, which we all know, which uh, uh, upon propofol treatment, sleeping in the uh, TOE, have a only moderate MR, um, we sometimes even give them uh, um, low doses of catecholamines in order to increase blood pressure. If uh, with those tests, uh, MR seems to have a hemodynamic effect, uh, I think the MR should be corrected uh, in any case. I don't know, uh, you are, you, you come from the largest um, or one of the the um, biggest centers in Germany, uh, biggest experience in treatment of MR and TR with edge to edge and other methods. And maybe your, your own opinion to this is just as important. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting answer. And I, I would absolutely agree because uh, what we learned is that some kind of stress echo uh, and uh, I don't know Wolfgang, maybe you can add a comment from your side as well. We, we, I remember that we even did some cases with a stress TOE, what is very rare, and um, we used most of the times, as you can imagine, dobotiotamine uh, to um, put the patient on, on stress. But as you said, if the MR increases, then we always uh, fix the MR first. And now, at least that's my experience uh, that is also continued in, in the St. Vincent's Hospital, that we go in these cases for the MR first, as you said. But maybe Wolfgang, can you, you're muted, uh, you're still muted, maybe you can switch on your mic, yeah. Oh, okay, you know I've changed the sites of uh, cardiology, I'm in a surgical department now and for me it's quite obvious that tricuspid is a very great uh, indication for doing it parallel to mitral. So if there is a functional mitral regurgitation, this must be decided before operation, of course. Interoperatively, we do it with vasopressin or uh, whatever you may do for increasing left ventricular pressure. Uh, but in general, we decide even in functional uh, mitral regurgitation, uh, specifically in those with atrial fibrillation induced mitral regurgitation, to do both sides. And uh, on your uh, conference uh, next week, I will talk about just that point, the parallel uh, intervention or from my side, the really good uh, operation reconstruction of the, in these patients is a very uh, effective therapy. And uh, as you told, uh, uh, Florian, that we see the patients too late with tricuspid regurgitation. This is what Professor Lutz also tells us. Most of these patients are at the end of their uh, myocardial disease history. But if we can go in further uh, uh, earlier, when the mitral valve is the problem and you have the HEFPEF patients and then you can do both sides, then it's, uh, for a surgeon, it's quite obvious to do both at, this, at a time. 
It's not a question of if it is very severe mitral degeneration or not. If we can do anything at the left side, it's uh, worthful to do the right side directly. Our experience. Okay. Okay. Sorry for interaction. We have a question from the audience, and uh, this is Dr. Nguyen Huang Fu from Ho Chi Minh City uh, uh, Hospital, and he has a question to Professor Kurtz. Dear Professor Kurtz, in case of TR due to ventricular lead pacemaker, single chamber or dual chamber pacemaker, what is your opinion? Should we use triclip or Pascal clip? Um, actually, I, I would not say that I have enough experience with the uh, tricuspid clipping method as of yet in order to give a good um, good answer. And it certainly, I certainly think that the answer will not be a predicament. Uh, maybe this really also will depend on the anatomy and also on the, uh, the site where the pacemaker actually uh, induces the um, the regurgitation in the within the valve. Um, we should ask Professor Sinning also to about his opinion with that. But as I said, the pacemaker induced TR sh should not be the one that you uh, treat first. Maybe we should ask Professor Sinning also. Yeah, that is a good point, and um, the question is very important, um, as uh, um, Florian Kurtz pointed out. If um, the TR is really primarily induced by a pacemaker lead, then I would really evaluate the patient if it is worth to take out uh, the right ventricular pacing lead, put in a micro device, and then go for tricuspid clipping. That is a little bit difficult, but um, to be honest, um, the first experiences I, I witnessed in Bonn with the um, off-label mitral clip device in tricuspid position when uh, the TR was induced by a pacemaker lead, have not been very good results. And I would add, if you go for tricusp for the triclip or uh, Pascal in tricuspid position, it doesn't make that difference. But um, my uh, uh, personal tip would be to evaluate if the, she uh, if the lead couldn't be removed, um, maybe uh, um, a micro could be implanted and then the patient could undergo triclip or Pascal uh, implantation. Okay, thank you for this uh, excellent uh, discussion of this hot topic. And now, uh, I uh, guess we uh, we want to go back to Dr. Birgit Gericke now. Her uh, internet is uh, it's going on again, and uh, she will continue her presentation. Chef, can you come out? Yeah. I kriege es nicht. Dann lass es doch da. Ja, Freigabe. Und dann dieses hier. Ja. Und dann, Und dann das hier. Okay. Und jetzt muss Und ich dann jetzt. Hier. Okay, danke. Hello again. Thank you for giving me a second chance. Um, I had some technical problems. Um, so I want to go on with um, my talk about heart failure medication. Chef, ich krieg's nicht. Uh, I showed you the new universal definition and classification for heart failure. And I was just talking about the new classification according to the um, left ventricular ejection fraction with the heart failure with improved ejection fraction. And I think this is very important for our therapeutical uh, side on the patient. Um, it's another thing whether the patient has been on ejection fraction below 30% and then improved with medication or if he has been only with 40% Five percent um, as its worthest um, ejection fraction. So, uh, in the first time, I would not stop any medication, and the other, I will not need to have uh, 
uh, things like mineral concrete uh, and receptor, receptor antagonists. So what is about therapy? First of all, uh, do the underlying disease, uh, do revascularization, do edge-to-edge -edge repair or TAVI and severe aortic stenosis in ablation, um, in atrial fibrillation, do ablation therapy, um, do devices, uh, do uh, cardiac resonation therapy, uh, go to um, alpha assist devices or go to heart transplantation. Uh, you have to think of all these for your patients. Let's go back one step to um, think about heart failure. A heart failure means there is a you do reduced stroke volume and that will activate structural, neural, humoral, cellular, molecular mechanisms that will lead to volume overload, sympathetic activity, cardiac remodeling, inflammation, that again will worsen the cardiac function and there will be more reduction of stroke volume. This is a vicious cycle in heart failure and the spiral will go downward and you can um, help with your medication. And you all know this analogy with the donkey uh, the donkey, this is the sick heart, and he has uh, the donkey has to work really hard with this. And um, pharmacological therapy and heart failure means to unload um, the car with uh, the things so that the donkey can do better, or to limit the speed. This is by beta blockers. And maybe you can give the heart for some moments uh, another um, goal to do. So let's look at all the medications and the drug therapy we have in chronic heart failure. And it's since 35 years when the first um, trials were published on ACE inhibitors, uh, they were against placebo and you so see that with ACE inhibitors, uh, the patients do well, and then there were the beta blockers, and then the mineralocorticoid antagonists, and then you see here the ARNI, and you see the Evabradin, you can see all this medication, and again and again, um, the medication will be better than placebo. And that's very important from this uh, work I've just showed you. They did a forest plot for all these medications. And you see here, when you add an, another medication, then um, the patients will do better. And that is not only for their um, capabilities, but this is mortality. So they will live longer with this for adding more uh, medications. So we are eager for looking for new medications. Let's have a look at the actual guidelines. They are from 2060, this is the ESC guideline. And it's, this is the American guidelines and they do not differ. They are only um, different um, schemes to follow, but they all show that ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, MR antagonists, and then the ARNI or the Evabradin goes, and then you have to consider other things. So they, the basis is the same. But when you see all these things, then you have to think uh, how many patients you have to deal with this medication um, so that mortality will be reduced. And for the ACE inhibitors, it's 26, it's nine for the beta blockers, it's only six for the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. And you have to look for the side effects. Every um, doctor, every physician who is dealing with heart failure patients should know these side effects and when to change medications. And he should know the initial daily doses and the target daily dose. I think this is very important for often 
uh, the patients will start with a low dose of heart failure therapy and uh, the target dose will never be reached. This is the second table for the evabradine and for the army and for the sodium glucose um, transporter uh, inhibitor. So you see, uh, you have to see for these uh, number needed to treat for mortality and for the side effects on further daily dose you have to reach. Why is this so important? This is not uh, old numbers, but this is from 2019. And this is the survival for heart failure for five years and for 10 years. And is, it is not very much better than 20 years ago. Also, we have so good medication in the last uh, years. Um, and I think this is because um, many patients will not get the target doses. This is um, data from um, an American uh, Congress uh, now in May this year. And these are patients with variable cardioverter defibrillator um, at uh, the index time and then 19 days later. And you see here for the beta blocker that at the beginning only 15% have the target dose, and um, three months later, it's only 25%. And it's the same for the ACE inhibitors or the uh, RNBs or the ARNIs. Uh, there are only few patients that will get the final, the target dose. And I think this is a problem. Um, and uh, Milton Pecker addressed this problem um, in a work in 2020, and he says that uh, there is only a very small fraction of patients that is below 1%. And I could not mention this number, below 1% uh, for the heart failure patients that will receive all um, the life prolonging treatments in the trial proven doses. I think this is a very small number and he says there are three stages. Um, the one where um, the patient receives the target dose uh, that is um, consistent with the trials. And then the stage three that he will not receive a specific treatment. And I think the most important is the status two where the patient receives a medication, but not in the um, target dose. And he says, this is because um, they have never been prescribed a higher dose or they had uh, asymptomatic changes in heart rate or blood pressure so that uh, the physician or the patient preferred not to um, give higher doses. And this is the same for the beta blocker or for the spironolactone or for the ARNI or for the ACE inhibitors. Um, there are often unsymptomatic uh, changes in blood pressures. Um, and I see this in daily life. The patient comes and says, I had a um, blood pressure of about 110 to 70. And so I will not um, take a higher dose. I don't want to do this. And my um, physician at home tells me the same. But what does this mean for the patient? You know, you see here dose dependent survival rates for the beta blocker and the different doses. You see here that uh, the survival is best with beta blocker in high doses but it's less favorable for the medium dose or the low dose, even if they are better than no better block at all. But um, this means uh, something to the patient. And I show you this slide with um, some calculations about survival. 
And you see here, there is uh, the survival after 44 years, 45 years, uh, a patient, and he gets the ACE inhibitor and the beta blocker. He has no milonyl corticoid receptor, receptor antagonists. It's uh, the data from the emphasis HF placebo group. And then you can see here the group with the ARN instead of the ACE inhibitor, the beta blocker, the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, and the SGLT2 inhibitor. And what means this for the patient? There is a difference between these both lines of 6.2 to 10.7 years. And I think this is a long time for a patient, and this is only uh, for um, giving the um, guideline recommended uh, therapy. Let's talk about the army. It was on the last slide. Uh, we can switch from an ACE inhibitor or uh, SATAN to uh, an army, and what we have to know is that we need to discontinue uh, the ACE inhibitor for at least 36 hours before we use the first dose of ARNI. This is because of the bradykinin. For if you give them simultaneous, there will be an accumulation of bradykinin and thus can provoke angioedema. Uh, if you have uh, Zatan, you can swap directly. I think in the new guidelines and the upcoming guidelines, uh, we will be allowed to start with an ANI in some patient groups. We in Gertigal uh, begin with an ANI in um, young and um, severely heart failure patients with um, ejection fraction of below 20%. We will not take the ACE inhibitor, but we will start with the ANI. Uh, to give the uh, patients the better um, medication uh, right from the beginning. I like this table very much. You see here all the studies from the last 35 years, and you see here um, the studies that were done uh, since the last guidelines were published. And I think the best to know is the sodium dependent glucose transporter 2 inhibitor. It worked in the kidney and there will be uh, the glucose reabsorption um, in the kidney and this will go together with sodium so that sodium and glucose will go with the urine and this means that the patient will lose the water and the sodium and the glucose, and this will help him uh, to have uh, a better outcome also with his diabetes, but, all, uh, but again, with his heart failure. And there are two um, great studies that were done with these uh, drugs. The one is the emperor reduced with the empagliflucine, and the other is the DARPA HF with the DARPA glyphrucine. Um, that were patients with an ejection fraction below 40%, um, but with um, not so bad uh, kidney function. The kidney was not normal, but it was not so bad. And you can see here that the primary outcome, this is the DARPA HF trial, the primary um, outcome was significantly reduced in the DARPA lifuzin uh, group. And the primary outcome is a combined endpoint from hospitalization and from death. Um, you see uh, that for hospitalization, it is um, significant. It's not significant for death uh, from cardiovascular cause or from death from any cause. Uh, but the outcome um, is good and you can prevent rehospitalizations for heart failure pa uh, patients. And you see here all the subgroups and uh, the best to know is 
that uh, the dopagliflucin works either in the type 2 diabetes patients and also in those who had no diabetes. And it was the same for the kidney function. Uh, the drug is working with preserved kidney function and also when the kidney function is lower. There is another study with um, dapagliflucin in uh, chronic kidney disease. And you can see here that uh, the dapagliflucin patients do better than the placebo patients in worsening the uh, cardiac function, though it's not only for good for the heart, but it's also good for the kidneys. The same is with the other substance with empagliflucin. The emperor reduced trial could also show that the primary outcome, which was hospitalization for heart failure and death was significantly reduced, um, but it was also not significant for death. But hospitalization is significantly reduced. And I think this is very important for our patients. What is about the side effects of the SGLT2 inhibitors? Um, there is a volume depletion. And so for daily practice, we have to look for our diuretics. Uh, and in some patients, you have to reduce the uh, um, amount of diuretic medication so that they will not have a volume depletion. Um, there may be a diabetic acidosis in this patient. It's not very often, but it may happen so that you have to be aware of this. And uh, there are many infections from the urogenital uh, system. So you have to talk with the patient about this. There is glucose in the urine and this may uh, promote these problems. So these are um, substances that you can give to every patient with heart failure when the renal function is not below 30%, 30 percent, um, 30 milligrams per liter. So what did our ESC guidelines on diabetes do with these data? Um, they have two groups of patients, the one that have no medication for the diabetes and the others that are on metformin. And if there is a cardiovascular risk, arteriosclerotic disease, um, then you will start with an uh, SGLT2 inhibitor uh, or a GLP-1 uh, therapy. So um, the cardiologist of today has to deal with diabetes and uh, he has to look at all these things. And we do not think about the glucose level um, at our first goal, but we have to think of uh, the mortality of the patients and their risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, I'm near Hanover, so we are waiting for the DIGIT HF study. Uh, Hanover High, uh, Medical School works uh, on the digitoxin for heart failure. It's an old drug. Uh, the old guidelines deal with the digoxin, and the digoxin has, um, I think, rather worse um, done in the last years. Um, so uh, we have to think that uh, this drug goes um, out of the body uh, via the kidneys and so that in our sick patients the levels will increase and this is not good for the nowadays target levels are lower and when you um, deal with uh, digitalis then please take the digoxine and uh, I think it will be very important to see the, to see the results of this study, I think they will come in two years. And there are two novel treatment approaches. The one is the Bericiguat. You know this class of substances from the 
real ziggurat, you know uh, that you can um, treat with this substance in those with chronic trump embolic um, pulmonary embolism. This is another of this group. It's a stimulator for the soluble guanulate cyclase. And the other is a myosine activator. The myosine activator Omicaptif micabil was tested in the galactic heart failure study. Let's go first to the Victoria study with the very Siguat. It was given in heart failure patients uh, with reduced ejection fraction. And you can see here that they were significant for the primary outcome. This means uh, no heart failure hospitalization, but it was not significant for death. Uh, so you can uh, um, help the patients with recent cardiac failure um, to stay stable with this substance, but uh, there are no data that you will decrease mortality. Um, the myosine activator, uh, helps uh, the myosin to bind to the um, troponi. You see that before you give uh, the substance, uh, only few of the arms of the myosin go to the uh, troponin, but with the substance, there will be more so that the myosin is activated. And um, the substance is uh, oral, given two times a day, um, and it was tested in the Galactic HF trial and published this year in January. And um, it's the same, there was um, patients with reduced heart failure, uh, with reduced ejection fraction, and they had recent heart failure episodes. And you see here that it's uh, significant for the combined um, outcome, with, which means heart failure hospitalization and death, but it's not significant for the death alone. So um, you can give these substance for patients who um, are very unstable, but you will not do anything for mortality uh, according to this data. So let's look at our patient. The heart failure patient uh, has more problems than only the heart. He has comorbidities. Most of them have more than eight comorbidities. Maybe his weight loss, he falls, he has physiological problems, dementia or depression. He has functional problems in daily life and he has social problems. Um, sometimes live, he lives alone or he has no social support. So um, think of all these uh, things. Um, I think the most important is the iron where we have uh, the new data. So let me summarize uh, my talk with um, this slide for this was published this year in the European Heart Journal and shows the Fantastic Four. Uh, the German will know that Fantastic Four, that is a band uh, with music, um, but uh, I think we have now the Fantastic Four also in cardiology for our heart failure patients. The beta blocker will stay on the stage. Uh, the MR antagonist will stay. The ARNI will be um, the better, but uh, ACE inhibitors or RIB um, are um, of value if the cost concerns. Uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors have shown that they are very valuable for our patients. And I think with all this fantastic fall, you have to deal with the other things around. Uh, I started with um, the slide where I showed you, you have to look for um, other problems like the valvular uh, things or 
and you find it here with the mitral edge-to-edge -edge repair or um, the CRT for the uh, pulmonary vein um, isolation, uh, the iron in ferric carboxymaltose. Uh, and I think this is a very good summary for what you have to look at uh, before you refer a patient to um, Elvert implantation or transplantation. So um, the new guidelines will come soon. They will, I think, arrive in um, August on the SC Congress for in the program of the Heart Failure Congress in June. I did not find the new guidelines. Um, and so I want to stop and thank you for your attention and thank you for your second, giving a second chance for me. Uh, and now I think uh, we will open for discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Birgit. And um, now, um, unfortunately, for reason of time, we are a little bit delayed. I have to notice uh, from the organizers that they we are very uh, delayed in uh, time, and so um, they wish that we can uh, uh, go on in the next uh, presentations. And um, the next topic is, is my topic, and uh, this is uh, the intervention of therapy of atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> and it's a great pleasure for me to speak about this topic. So you all know that the last in last year 2020 there are the new EC guidelines for uh, the treatment the diagnosis and treatment of atrial fibrillation and uh, this guideline shows that uh, this so upgrade of uh, indication of uh, catheter ablation in atrial fibrillation. So catheter ablation is a class one indication for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and also for the persistent atrial fibrillation. And the STAR-F study uh, has shown, has shown uh, what to do in atrial fibrillation. It has compared uh, cell pulmonary vein is isolation with additional atrial ablation in lines or electrograms. And this study has shown that the pulmonary vein isolation is the uh, same effective than, uh, than ablation in the left atrium, so that the guidelines uh, mention that the complete electrical isolation of the pulmonary vein is recommended during all AF catheter ablation procedures. So this is the cornerstone, the pulmonary vein isolates the cornerstone in catheter ablation of pulmonary ablation, still in 2021. But the new guidelines mention also that uh, the, the characterization of the substrate of atrial fibrillation uh, will be more and more uh, will be more and more um, important. And so atrial enlargement and fibrosis, so the characteristics of the substrate. And we know the uh, studies, the studies from the Marouche group is more than 10 years old, but it's, all, it's uh, still um, uh, actual that the left atrial strain and strain rate in patients with paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation is related to the left atrial structural modeling detected by MRI. And you see here the correlation of the grade of atrial fibrosis to left atrial function parameters like left atrial strain. And the authors concluded that LR wall fibrosis by MRI is inversely related to L strain and strain rate. And these are related to F burden. So echocardiographic assessment of L structural and functional remodeling is quick and feasible and may be helpful in uh, predicting outcomes of AF. And uh, the uh, Knebel's group from the building have investigated the left atrial mechanics and have concluded that the left atrial mechanics predict the success of pulmonary vein isolation patients with atrial fibrillation. And you see here the 2D strain derived reservoir function of patients and uh, in the patient where the, the, where the reservoir function is uh, preserved, they are good responders in catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation, whereas patients 
who have decreased uh, 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 reservoir function were non-responders after catheter ablation. So in summary, the left atrial size of volume index is not a sufficient parameter of LF function. And the functional remodeling is more important than structural remodeling. The correlation of LS strain, uh, spec tracking, and fibrosis in cardiac MRI and LS strain is predict outcome after P PVI. And so the impact of atrial contribution in patients with half path is outstanding. And the prognosis may depend on systolic and diastolic LF function. So that is the uh, uh, so-called DCAF2 study ongoing. This is a prospective study, and this study wants to investigate the, uh, the uh, in consequence to these findings, the fibrosis guided versus conventional ablation, and the estimated follow-up completion is this year. And we are very excited to see uh, to see the results of this study. Now, can uh, during atrial fibrillation and heart failure, there's an interesting, uh, interesting study uh, published uh, four years ago, the so-called camera MRI study. And this study have compared patients uh, who were uh, good, uh, who were sufficient rate controlled with medical uh, drug therapy, uh, have compared them to patients who have underwent an um, catheter ablation. And so this study want to show the additional benefit of catheter ablation despite sufficient rate control. And here are the results. You see here that the, the, uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction is improved after catheter ablation comparing to medical rate control. And so that uh, this study uh, wants to highlight that only the, the, the rate control is not enough for patients for patients with heart failure. And this uh, uh, landmark study, the Castle Aftercare study, you all know the study. This uh, study was the first trial uh, that has shown the better outcome in patients after catheter ablation comparing to medical therapy. Uh, so that, that were patients who, were, uh, who have severe heart failure with implanted ICD or CRT. And these patients um, uh, have a uh, significant uh, better outcome after catheter ablation comparing to medical therapy. So that the actual guidelines of 2020 uh, um, mentioned that catheter ablation is recommended to reverse LV dysfunction in tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, class one indication, and also in patients, in selected patients with have ref with uh, heart failure with reducted, uh, reducted uh, ejection fraction to improve survival, to improve survival and reduce a heart failure hospitalization with a 2A recommendation. And this is a clinical case report of one patient in our clinic uh, with a patient uh, with uh, long standing uh, atrial fibrillation with uh, elevated uh, heart rate. And uh, initial ejection fraction is uh, very reduced, is, uh, is highly reduced, 32% uh, AF. And we uh, could not directly uh, um, cut this patient because he has had an uh, LLA thrombus. And uh, so we have to uh, control, uh, control the heart rate uh, and do some anticoagulation. And uh, you see here, under controlled heart rate, the ejection fraction is still reduced. And here at this time, we, after resolve, uh, resolution of the thrombus, we have cut revert and ablate these patients. And in sinus rhythm, you see here the uh, restored uh, LV ejection fraction and the norm of a full, uh, like reverse remodeled uh, left atrium here. You see the large. Uh, left atrium and here normalized uh, left atrium size. And uh, these slides, I want to only mention here the uh, increased uh, booster function in sinus rhythm after restoring of the sinus rhythm. Well, when to do, uh, when to perform uh, catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation? So uh, I want to give you some rational for early rhythm control strategy. 
as you all know, that atrial fibrillation is a progressive disease. And there are some studies have shown that there's a marked uh, transition from proximate state states of atrial fibrillation in persistent or permanent state. And uh, so here, for example, a PET field in 2015 shows a 4 to 15% progression from proximal atrial fibrillation to persistent forms per year, depending on age, sex, cardiovascular risk factors. And so the early rhythm control strategy to stop and delay progression may be favorable. So Collins Cook, uh, in line with this, Collins Cook have uh, published the so-called test study. And the, uh, the, the, the uh, fees of the, uh, the study is the catheter, the catheter ablation can delay progression from proximal to persistent atrial fibrillation. And the studies have included the typical uh, population of proximal atrial fibrillation patients with uh, age more than 60 years with uh, proximal atrial fibrillation and have uh, randomized in an RF ablation group with pulmonary vein isolation and an antirhythmic therapy group. And you can see, as you can see here cl uh, clearly in the results, that there's a significant the lower rate of persistent AFRAT with ablation than with antirhythmic drug therapy. So the patients undergoing RF ablation were about 10 times less likely than antirhythmic drug patients to develop a persistent AF. So that the um, authors concluded that in patients with drug refractory paroxysm atrial fibrillation, an early RF ablation was superior to antirhythmic drug therapy in delaying progression to persistent atrial fibrillation. So in line of this last year, that was also a landmark study published on the group of Paulus Kirchhoff, the so-called East AFNET-4 trial. And this, this uh, big trial have investigated early rhythm control therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation. And um, these are the study data. More than 2,800 patients were randomized in an early rhythm control strategy uh, versus an, um, an uh, rate control strategy. And the rhythm control uh, were achieved with drugs uh, and or atrial fibrillation Ablation. That was the result of the study. You see here that the uh, early, early con rhythm control study was significantly superior for the first primary outcome, which included death from cardiovascular causes, stroke, acute coronary syndrome, hospitalization with worsening of heart failure. And so this study highlights that the early rhythm control therapy may be beneficial for patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. And at the end of my uh, talk, I want to uh, show you uh, one new technology. Sorry. Uh, wait. Yeah, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Zach. Okay. Can you see me? Uh, yeah. Okay. I want to introduce a new technology in catheter ablation, the so-called pulse field ablation (PFA). And uh, to introduce is that the multiple catheter ablation technologies have been introduced over the last years, predominantly aiming at better and durable lesion formation to improve clinical success. And this has also led to a decrease of overall complications, but still severe complications such as tamponade, L esophageal fistula, and PV stenosis do still occur. And the pulse field ablation has the potential to combine a high ablation success rate with no or minimal complications. The pulse field ablation, so-called PFA, is a form of ir irreversible electroporation that uses a train of bipolar and biphasic pulses of high voltage, more than 500 volts. 
and short duration to create tissue injury without significant heating. It's like an electro, small, uh, short electroshocks uh, in the pulmonary vein. And the mechanism of lesion formation in irreversible electroporation is a function of electric field exposures that break down cell membrane permeability, leading to cell death. And a unique feature of the pulse field ablation is tissue specificity. That means that the myocardium is very susceptible to irreversible injury, whereas the esophagus, phrenic nerves, pulmonary veins, and coronary arteries are relatively resistant to the injury. So the tissue specificity. What he has, uh, I want to uh, show you shortly some technical terms here. Here's the, 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 the circular uh, ablation catheter. Um, and uh, over a short time of 36 milliseconds, there are here uh, biphasic and bipolar shocks pulses here with 500 volts here. And uh, after a time of 36 milliseconds, you can see here, uh, Cross ablation, the pulmonary vein uh, electrograms will disappear. And so preparing to the, uh, the normal rubber frequency ablation, the effect is more impressive here. And you see here the, uh, some uh, histological um, images of the cell membrane. After 36 milliseconds, the cell membrane of the cardiomyocyte is damaged and there's this uh, uh, cell death. You see here in the microscopic preparation of the uh, right atrial uh, appendage, there's a continuous lesion after pulse uh, uh, field ablation. And uh, important is that the, uh, the, the fat tissue and here the, uh, the uh, blood vessels, they are still there. They are not damaged after this pulse field ablation. You see this only the cardiomyocytes uh, were ablated. And so uh, sparing the epicardial fat and sparing also the infralesial arteries. So the Vivek Reddy from uh, New York have done uh, two um, nice short studies with these uh, so-called Farapus uh, devices. Uh, this is the catheter uh, uh, which is called Farapulse. It's a two um, forms with a, a basket form or a flower form. And uh, very important is the safety profile of this uh, pulse field ablation catheter. So you can see here that there's only in two sh short, small studies, only one cardiac tamponade uh, as a adverse event. And they have uh, seen no other adverse events in this uh, ablation procedure, procedure, no esophageal lesions, no uh, phrenic paresis, no uh, uh, stroke. And, uh, and then the three D electroanatomical mapping showed um, nicely isolated pulmonary veins after pulsefeed ablation, and also the clinical success rate after pulsefeed ablation is very good. We have seen uh, after uh, one year. 87% of the patients serve in sinus rhythm after pulse fit ablation. So ladies and gentlemen, so I'm very good in time. It's, uh, it's just 40 minutes. I want to summarize. So there are the new EC guidelines in 2020 and in these guidelines, the uh, recommendation of catheter ablation were upgraded. So defining structural and functional values for individualized substrate based Ablation uh, strategies is very important. So early rhythm control strategy may be favorable and there is an improved outcome after catheter ablation patients with heart failure. And concerning new technologies, the so-called pulse field ablation, the PFA is a new energy form and the new energy application with promising data for pulmonary vein isolation. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Right. For you, very interesting presentation. I think it's a very excellent, excellent lecture for us. I hope we can do it in the Vietnam in the future. Okay. <laughs> yes. Do you have any yes. any question yes. from the audience? Maybe I uh, may ask um, two very um, quick questions, Dr. Nguyen. 
first of all, congratulations on this uh, excellent talk. And uh, second, I would like to thank you for this great partnership I had during the last year. And um, personally, I really enjoyed to work with you very, very much. And for me, um, I have really to say that you took electrophysiology to the next level. So I learned a lot. And maybe um, regarding this uh, experience of the last year that I, I enjoyed so much, two quick questions. Is, to be a little bit provocative, is there any patient at all that should not undergo um, primary um, pulmonary vein isolation? That's my first question. And the second question is um, regarding a topic we discussed uh, on uh, very often, what would be a candidate? Um, I mean, you know both sides of the story. What would be a candidate for you um, that un should undergo pulmonary vein isolation first? Uh, when um, he or she is suffering from uh, severe mitral regurgitation and only afterwards um, we should go for mitral clip. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, President Dinning. Uh, it's a pleasure for me too to uh, the last year to work with you and uh, it's a fantastic atmosphere in our clinic. And um, so uh, to your question, the first patient, uh, who are not good candidate for pulmonary vein isolation. So this, in, in my opinion, this, the characterization of the left aqueous substrate so as functional or structural is very important. And we have discussed the left aqueous contribution. And uh, so in my, uh, um, in my view, when you have a patient who have a very enlarged atri uh, um, uh, left atrium with uh, bad uh, strain or with uh, bad uh, with no acre contribution after electrocardioversion. So this patient uh, would not uh, profit uh, from uh, from achieving the sinus problem. So, uh, so this is our project in St. Vincent's Hospital with Wolfgang Feske for the future to detect patients who will uh, profit uh, from sinus rhythm and patients who would not profit from sinus rhythm. So in my opinion, the characterization of the, of the substrate uh, before, uh, before ablation would be uh, in the future very important. And the second uh, question is, uh, you, uh, you all know we see the patients with the severe mitral regurgitation and atrial fibrillation. And one uh, important aspect is that we, we have to divide the, the uh, atrial fibrillation uh, also in the, in the, in the classical uh, ventricular atrial uh, mitral regurgitation um, comparing to the, to the functional atrial mitral regurgitation. And there are patients who have an enlarged um, left atrium and develop the mitral regurgitation. And uh, in these patients, the first approach for them is, is not directly in the, uh, the, uh, the, the mitral grip, but in these patients, we have to do the, the, a very early catheter ablation to restore the sinus rhythm. So uh, some studies uh, then have shown the so-called reverse remodeling uh, of the left atrium and so a marked reduction of the micro regurgitation. Move to the next talk. We'd like to invite Dr. Slaterbeck. May, may I perhaps um, ask, uh, this is an open field of remodeling of the left atrium and uh, remodeling of the left ventricle and perhaps also of uh, mitral regurgitation. Let me ask a question for everybody. Uh, what is your opinion about a, a closure or ablation of the left auricle? Is this a site of a new arrhythmic a substrate or uh, is that uh, independent and is only to exclude a uh, possible risk of thromboembolic events? To you this question. Yes, thank you. The left atrial appendage is um, it's very controversial in the electrophysiologic field. Um, but there are some groups have shown that the left atrial appendage is the uh, is, um, there are some extra pulmonary vein 
extra pulmonary vein triggers for atrial fibrillation. And so these groups have isolated, isolated the left atrial appendage, for example, with a cry balloon and have reached some good uh, results for uh, restoring sinus rhythm in patients with atrial fibrillation and, uh, and uh, still uh, isolated pulmonary veins. So in my opinion, it's very, uh, it's very important to uh, investigate mm, the left atrial appendage. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to invite Dr. Slaughterback. You, you are here? Yes, I'm here. Dr. Slaughterback, you talk about gender differences in acute coronary, coronary syndrome. Please, Dr. Splat. Okay, you can see my presentation? Yes, we see you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, virtual symposium and my best greetings to my, our friends in Vietnam. Hope to see you back again in your country soon so we can uh, do a congress again in your country. Um, my topic is uh, Gender differences in acute coronary syndromes. I will uh, give you some causes for differences, pa different pathologies, and also speak about different outcomes. Um, let me begin with a very old slide. Um, we could see from this slide that already in 1984, um, there was a, a sharp decline in cardiovascular disease mortality in men and an increase in women. This um, continued until the last age century. Um, and new dates um, we have from um, 2019 now. Um, on the left side, you can see that there is a um, um, slightly decrease for the blue columns um, for men over the years for hospitalization for acute coronary syndromes, but a, a, a strong increase for women over the years until 2013 um, with hospitalization. And also in a, a study from France, uh, there could be seen that um, for younger women, there is an increase for acute coronary syndromes um, for, for um, 6 percent in 10 years um, for the hospitalization. Um, if you look at the at an American registry, um, the in-hospital procedures um, also di were different um, in male and in female. There were less invasive procedures for, um, for women, um, more non-invasive uh, testing. There was a, a less, uh, um, now I have, a, um, I have this, uh, the lecture from Paul Vogt on my screen. <laughs> Could you please uh, return my, um, Yes, so maybe, can you see it again? No. Kannst du deinen Bildschirm noch mal freigeben? Und Siehst du was jetzt? Noch nicht. Gib noch mal deinen Bildschirm unten frei bei, bei Zoom. Okay. Doch, jetzt kommt's. So, also, jetzt, jetzt, kommt's. jetzt kommt's, okay. Ja, ja, ist da jetzt den Bildschirmmodus, den Präsentationsmodus? Oder? Ja. Bin dabei. Okay. Warte. Okay. Okay. Super. okay. Thank you. Um, so um, I, I, I told you that there is a, there was a, um, let's go back. That there was a less invasive strategy for women than in male also um, with um, acute um, Invasive procedures. There were less um, um, less PCI in in women than in men, and also the coronary artery graft uh, uh, grafting was 
um, um, much uh, more, um, much much less uh, than in um, in in male. Um, where therefore we we can see in this uh, um, large study from the ESC that there is a difference uh, differences in in uh, mortality. We can see that um, um, for for men with um, STEMI, you have a 30-day mortality for 4.3. And for um, women, we have a 30-day um, mortality for 10.2. Overall mortality was 5.8. So what are the causes? We know that one of the causes are the different sex hormones of a lifetime. Here you can see of course, that um, there's a sharp decline um, from estradiol in, um, in the menopause for women and a slightly increase for androgen for women in this time, whereas um, testosterone um, only is slowly de decreasing over the lifetime of men. Um, of course, we, can, we know that these hormones have different um, effects on arteriosclerosis, uh, thrombus formation, uh, vasoreactivity, and vascular apoptosis. Um, this leads to a different pathology. Um, if we have an, andro an estrogen um, decline and a, um, um, an androgen increase, that leads us to a, a hyperandrogenism, and um, therefore we have a some influences on the insulin resistance and the co compensatory um, hyperinsulinemia. And that's, that leads us also to a, a more pro-inflammatory state and also, um, also a change in body distribution and insulin sensitivity Overall, that leads um, on the one hand to more glucose intolerance, more diabetes type two, and on the other hand, vascular effects for more hypertension and um, more of these um, cardiovascular diseases. There are other strong influences um, for the effects um, um, for uh, women, there is a, a strong association um, to depression. Um, hypertension is more common in women um, with ACS than in men. Uh, smoking is a stronger predictor in women than in men. Diabetes has a higher risk for a diabetic women than for diabetic men. There's a higher prevalence in younger women with ACS. Uh, kidney disease has some influence, and of course, pregnancy-related risk. We all know that if you have a if a woman has a, a gestational hypertension, there is a high risk for later hypertension and also for the diabetes. Also, the uh, history of preeclampsia is a high risk factor. There are specific risk factors in female specific risk factors like polycystic ovarian syndrome. There is a premature menopause. There is a rheumatoid arthritis and also lupus erythematodes. Um, we all we know since 1999. Uh, nine, from uh, a study from Gold that um, the female pattern of coronary heart disease is different. They have a female, uh, women have smaller vessel diameter, have a coronary ischemia with non-obstructive coronary heart disease more often, um, microvascular coronary disease, small vessel disease we call that, um, diffuse coronary manifestation with worse prognosis and less calcification than men, more soft, soft plaques, and um, it disturbances of the vasomotoric regulation of the vessels. So we, in the, in the upper line, you can see that the, the coronary heart disease is more diffuse atherosclerosis, while in men it's uh, predominantly focal stenosis. Um, 
the different clinical appearance in men and women, we can see with the coronary, um, acute coronary syndromes, three differentiations. There is the STEMI, ST elevation, um, myocardial infarction and STEMI, non-ST elevation, and now uh, a third one, the MINOCA. Um, I will speak about that. Um, there are some characteristics um, in the differential diagnosis, which we have always to look up. Um, I go over this for the sake of time and um, come to the uh, different to the definition of the myenoca. Myenoca is a myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. arteries. Um, that is an angiographic um, diagnosis. So if you have a um, signs of a troponin positive situation um, and you do an angio and there, are, there is a non-obstructive coronary artery disease uh, below 30 or 50 percent. Um, this, um, this is the definition of the MINOCA. You have to look at um, other reasons for the troponin positive um, for the troponin positive situation like pulmonary embolism, cardiac contusion, and other non-cardiac reasons like um, renal ins insufficiency. And then you have to do a work up for this uh, um, disease. Um, Minoca pathologies are often a plug rupture, a plug erosion, a thrombosis, SCAT is a spontaneous coronary artery disease, and that leads to this um, results of a non-obstructive um, myocardial infarction. We have it in one of eight women with myocardial infarction have MINOCA, about 5% of all myocardial infarctions. There's a mortality about 5.7% um, over, overall in 12 months. It's not a harmless disease. And 25% have recurrent angina in the first year. Um, the standard therapy, therapy is um, 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 different and has to be adapted to the situation, but normally C CSA inhibition, beta blockade, and uh, um, blood pressure medication. There is a controversy at the moment about a dual platelet therapy. This is an example, a 30-year-old woman which came, we came to the emergency department with this uh, ECG, signs of a uh, acute um, ST elevation myocardial infarction. The ECG changed very click, quickly. The ST elevation was no, not seen um, in the further time. And in the angel, there were no signs of a, a obstructive coronary artery disease. So we did an OCT. And we could see that there was a small blood rupture, as you can see here in this, um, in this area, and with a small thrombus building. So this was the reason for the elevation of the, um, of the, um, of the troponin. There is now uh, an, um, a hint for the workup um, from the AC, a ACC. Um, for, for this situation, normally you do a coronary angio and also a, a, a ventriculography. You do um, you do your diagnostic guide wire and do your adenosine test for FFR and also the index and the flow reserve, and then you can work up um, until you do a, a vasoreactivity test with acetylcholine. We did this in former times. Uh, not begin yet. So um, this is the proposal for the work up here. So you can say you have a non-cardiac pain, epicardial, vasospastic angina, microvascular angina, or another reason for this uh, situation. Let me come back to the <coughs> specific pathologies. Um, the normal pathology um, seen in the, in the upper in the upper uh, pictures here is the type A myocardial infarction with a thrombus and blood rupture and occlusion of the vessel. 
This is predominant for men. Uh, women have often a scut, as I told you before, a spontaneous coronary artery dissection with an intima, intimal tear and um, hematoma, and as seen here. Um, what is SCAT? It's a non-traumatic, non-iotronic, uh, non-atherosclerotic separation of the coronary artery wall by intraluminal hemorrhage, creating a false lumen with an intimal tear. Um, it's a very difficult um, situation to manage because um, you can, if you do an intervention, you have problems sometimes to come in the true lumen and so you can have many problems for um, putting a stand in, in this situation. There are some spe specific um, angiographic um, signs which uh, we have to learn from the angels. Um, here is uh, from SOAR uh, differentiation in, in two, uh, in three different um, angiographic signs. And I will show you some of them um, in, uh, in the angel. This is um, on, on, the, on the left side here, you can see this small um, lucent um, um, angel, um, filling um, defect. And in the middle upstairs, you can see also a very thin vessel wall, um, which is um, very difficult to recognize um, that this is a scut. Also, in, in here are some other examples which are not very easy um, to um, recognize in the um, in in the angel. So um, one of the proposal is that if you have a a, a non uh, you have a um, a scut in an area which is not life-threatening and a patient is stable, that there is a conser conservative uh, management better than uh, acute revascularization. Because as I told you before, it could be very difficult to, um, to manage <clears throat> um, and to put, uh, to put a stand in if you have a, a long dissection. Um, Causes for the, for the um, spontaneous coronary artery dissections are uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. There are pregnancy-related reasons. And there are some connective tissue disorders which lead to, to um, more SCAT, um, for example, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And there are some um, systemic inflammatory diseases like lupus, Crohn's disease, colitis, uh, polyarteritis nodosa, a church strauss, and more of them, which can lead to this uh, spontaneous dissection. Um, this is an example. I hope um, you can see it. This was a young woman came to the, uh, came to the ambulance with a uh, one hour chest pain. Um, ECG was um, was significant for uh, anterior infarction. And you can see here that this was a long dissection from the ostia of the LAD. It was a very a, a unstable situation. So we had to intervene uh, in this case. And there was also a, already a thrombus formation. Um, uh, one other specific pathology, which is uh, in cardiovascular disease more um, for women, is um, this one, which was found in, in, in Japan uh, during the, an earthquake uh, epidemic. Um, um, and it is called, as you all know, um, this Takotsubu cardiomyopathy. And the name derives from this um, pot from these fishermen's and you have a you have a, a specific signs in the angio in the left ventricular level graphy um, like seen in this picture um, here is uh, here are some emotional triggers you know that the takotsubo syndrome 
um, has uh, the reason in the um, adrenic, and adrenic status um, uh, uh, activation of the sympathicus. Um, there are more some reasons like um, 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 some acute um, family disorders, some, some um, pain operations. And we, we have a lot of reasons which can cause these um, um, many emotional triggers which can cause this disease, um, also some physical triggers. Um, this is the this is the typical um, levography um, on the left, but there are also atyp atypical level, um, levographies like seen on the right. And we know that um, the outcome of Takotsubo is um, not benign. We know that there is a, a, um, also a um, um, worse outcome um, with uh, death and cardiogenic shock. And, and you can see here that um, 30 days mortality is about um, 5% and the long-term outcome is also uh, not a benign disease. So for finish up some um, cardiovascularly disease mortality um, over the world, there was a, an interesting presentation in the ESC 2019. Um, there was an age standardized cardiovascular mortality, and we can see that the greatest mortality um, were in the Oceania, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and Central Sub-Saharan Africa, lowest in high-income Asia, Pacific, Aust Australia, and Western Europe. Um, Vietnam has a, 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 a age uh, standardized cardiovascular mortality for women uh, in the low range. Um, but um, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in women from 1990 to 2017, the greatest increase was in East Asia, um, Eastern Europe and South Asia, including countries as Bangladesh and China. Greatest decrease was in Western Europe, um, Australia, and um, high-income Asia-Pacific countries. Um, beneath um, um, coronary heart disease, there's also a high uh, prevalence for stroke. Also in Asia, not, not so more in, 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 in Europe. Um, this is the end of my talk. Um, I hope everyone could hear it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus. And uh, other questions from the expert panel? Okay, so when there's uh, no question, we are uh, going, we are still a little bit uh, delay in time. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker. This is Professor uh, Dr. Jan Malte Zinni from uh, our St. Vincent's Hospital. He's an outstanding expert in interventional cardiology. And uh, this topic is the percutaneous treatment of free vessel and left main disease, state of the art. Thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen, um, dear Professor Nguyen, dear Dr. Nguyen, dear Wolfgang, dear colleagues in Vietnam and dear ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to contribute to this virtual Vietnamese German Cardiology Symposium here um, tonight. And I hope that we will be able to meet in person next year again. So um, I would like to start my talk uh, with the first left main PCI that has been performed uh, worldwide who invented it. Um, it has taken place in um, Germany and Frankfurt, uh, to be honest. And Andreas Grünzig himself, his fourth um, PTCA was a patient with a left main stenosis. He treated, as you can see here, uh, with the fluoroscopic images the 24th and back in 1977. So a very, since the first treatment, 
uh, moving pictures say more than a thousand words, I would like to start with a case example. And this is an 81 year old gentleman um, that presented to our hospital with NSTEMI, so an acute setting. And if you um, calculate the syntax score to quantify the complexity of the coronary artery disease in this patient, you calculate a syntax score of 32. So what um, do we see in, here in this example? We have a um, stenosis of the um, LAD, which seems quite uh, severely calcified. And we have a stenosis um, of the left main, a distal left main stenosis that maybe also involves uh, the circumflex artery. So if you take a look at the European uh, Society of Cardiology guidelines that have been updated back in 2018, you see uh, this at a first glance quite complex scheme, but to summarize a little bit better, um, I would like to um, show you this um, more simplified um, algorithm that has been published by the German Cardiac and Cardiothoracic Society. And if we um, look for our patient here in the scheme, we see a 1A recommendation if this patient would undergo cabbage. We will talk on this later. And we see a 2A recommendation for, uh, this means uh, left main, uh, with a syntax score of 32. But if the syntax score would have been a little bit higher, then we see already a three recommendation. So this patient should not undergo PCI. He um, should better undergo cabbage. But, and there was the main message of the last slide, uh, obviously, um, PCI should only be considered if the heart team is concerned about the surgical risk or if the patient refuses cabbage after adequate counsel. What evidence do we have right now for the treatment of three vessel and left main disease? And let's start um, with the mother of all studies, the syntax trial published here 12 years ago by Patrick C. Royce. And as you can see here, after the first year, PCI compared to cabbage, there's no mortality difference. Also, the combined maze endpoint was not uh, the combined heart endpoint was not that different, but uh, maze was uh, significantly higher. Um, for the PCI arm um, triggered, as you can see here in the lower left corner, by repeat revascularization. So what is the situation 10 years later in the syntax trial? If you take a look at these four Kaplan-Meier uh, graphs, we see here regarding the primary endpoint still uh, a detectable but non-different, uh, uh, non-significant difference for, for PCI compared to cabbage. We see no difference for patients with left main disease. We see no difference, interestingly, for patients suffering from diabetes after 10 years. That has been a little bit different after five years, you might um, remember. The only subgroup we see a difference uh, regarding the treatment of uh, um, PCI is three vessel disease. So patients with three vessel disease only without left main regardless whether they were suffering from diabetes or not, they had a, a mortality disadvantage compared to cabbage after 10 years. So um, if one study is not enough, you can do meta-analysis um, of different uh, um, and more studies. And this has been published by the colleagues uh, in the Netherlands and Lancet three years ago. Um, if you sum up more than 7,000 patients from 11 RCTs and this um, uh, meta-analysis, you can see here for, the, for three vessel disease, a significant difference um, and uh, patients with PCI had a higher mortality compared to cabbage patients as shown in the syntax trial. And if you take a look at the subgroup analysis um, regarding left main disease, you don't see any mortality difference at all. But to be honest, do these trials represent standard of care right now? I mean, these results have been 10 years ago uh, published. Um, and if we take a closer look at these studies, the syntax score was used to quantify disease complexity. This is still uh, um, our current recommendation of the guidelines, but this has to be questioned, at least from my uh, standpoint. In these studies, early generation drug eluting stents have been used that we wouldn't use anymore in our practice. Uh, um, remember the um, Texas stent that has been 
uh, used primarily in syntax and also the freedom trial. In these um, studies, the rates of FFR or IFR guided strategy had been very low or even non-existent in the syntax trial. Most of the trials didn't use intravascular imaging to guide PCI optimization. And um, a very um, a critical disadvantage in the syntax trial was the low rate of complete revascularization that was more than 57% in the PCI arm. And something that has to be discussed is that only low risk patients have been included in these trials. So the syntax score, I think this is quite clear, um, has been used in these studies. It has a, still a 1B uh, recommendation in the guidelines, but as some of you might know, it has been uh, become a little bit more complex to calculate the score as it is only available as, a, as an app for Android or iOS anymore. And there's no uh, web-based calculator anymore. If we take a look at um, next generation DES here in the Spirit 4 trial published also 11 years ago, there's a clear significant um, difference compared to these early generation drug limiting stents with more than one third reduction of MACE uh, in this study here published in the New England Journal. If you take a look, and I'm going to this very quickly due to reasons of time, I hope uh, um, I can apologize for this. If you take a look at the FAME1 trial, if you compare an FFR-guided PCI strategy um, compared to an angiography-guided uh, uh, strategy only, then you still have a maze reduction, and these green marked endpoints are all significant. You have a maze reduction of 28% compared to the strategy that has been used in the syntax trial. And if we take an even closer look at the FAME 1 trial, what else did we learn from this trial? We learned that angiography is inaccurate in assessing the functional significance of coronary stenosis when compared with FFR. You can see here that um, angiography um, assessed stenosis between 50 and 70% only have been 35% uh, um, positive when measured by um, FFR. And even more interesting, uh, even stenosis between 70 and 90 percent uh, um, diameter stenosis have been only 80 percent positive by FFR. So this is a strategy that has to be questioned in our uh, daily routine. And what else did we learn um, taken together um, when we took a look at more than 500 patients with angiography and geographically defined multivessel disease in the FAME 1 trial? When assessed by FFR, these patients uh, were downgraded and only 46% had a functional multi-vessel multi disease. And as you can see here, more than one third only had a one vessel disease and uh, wouldn't have been cabbage patients at all in this trial. What is also important is intravascular imaging that cannot be emphasized more because it decreases the rate of target vessel failure as shown in this quick example published by the Chinese colleagues in the ultimate trial published in, uh, three years ago in Jack. So by using IVIS in our clinical daily routine, these uh, um, colleagues have been able to reduce the rate of target vessel failure by more than 60% after one year, what is quite impressive, I would say. And taking all these strategies together, the use of next generation drug eluding stents, IVIS, FFR to optimize and guide our uh, stenting strategy. In the Syntax 2 trial, um, we encountered a very uh, significant difference when compared the Syntax 2, when comparing the Syntax 2 PCI arm to the Syntax 1 PCI arm with a MACE reduction of more than 40%, a myocardial infarction, in, infarction a reduction of more than 70%, and even a uh, um, reduction of the target vessel revascularization rate of more than 40% after only one year. So putting this into context, when we compare the Syntax 2, two to a PCI arm, which is not a new randomized trial for sure, but if we compare to the PCI results of the Syntax 1 trial, we um, see and experience a significant reduction of the uh, endpoint, which was even better than the PCI FFR um, from the FAME 1 trial. So um, these have been all studies uh, performed as randomized clinical trials. I would also present an experience from the New York State Registry as a, uh, an all-comers registry with more than 18,000 propensity score matched patients. Um, approximately half of the patients suffered from triple vessel disease and left main disease. And you, 
As you can see here, if we compare patients um, undergoing a PCI, multi-vessel PCI with recent um, drug diluting, with recent generation drug diluting stents, then we see no difference between PCI and cabbage uh, regarding death. We see a significant difference uh, in favor of PCI for the occurrence of stroke after uh, um, PCI. And what we again observe in this registry, we observe a highly higher rate of myocardial infarction after multivessel PCI compared to cabbage. And the reason for this is quite obvious. If you take a look at the revascularization rate in these patients, and if you see and compare only the patients that had complete revascularization after um, EES means Everolimus eluting stent implantation compared to cabbage, then you see that these patients that have been completely revascularized didn't have a uh, um, difference regarding the myocardial infarction rate of the inclusion. And only these patients that have been incompletely revascularized uh, had been different rates of myocardial infarctions. So if we put in together um, the results of recent trials, uh, especially the Nobel and the Excel trial, uh, um, has been discussed extensively in the last years. If you put uh, together these newer trials and compare the risk of mortality of uh, um, patients undergoing left main PCI, and these are more than 4,600 patients, then we see no mortality risk regarding uh, um, PCI versus cabbage. But again, as I've shown you from this uh, New York State registry, we see a slightly higher rate for repeat and unplanned revascularization after PCI compared to cabbage. So if the heart team has to make a decision in this patient I've shown to you in the beginning of my talk regarding cabbage versus PCI, we have to take into account several uh, circumstances. On the one hand side, an acute illness, if a patient presents with acute coronary syndrome or even worse, cardiogenic shock, then this for sure favors PCI. If the patient has an unsuitable coronary anatomy to undergo PCI, has a high syntax score, multivessel disease, or maybe is suffering from diabetes, then this favors for sure a uh, cabbage. But we have to keep in mind that our patients are very often suffering from comorbidities such as frailty, COPD, and uh, maybe other things like porcelain aorta or already underwent uh, open heart surgery in recent years. And that's something I would like uh, to emphasize and we can maybe discuss on later. The patients that have been included in these randomized control, control trials uh, comparing PCI versus cabbage all have been low-risk patients here uh, um, reflected by the logistic euro score that we don't use anymore in these times for sure. But uh, in these days, it was our tool to quantify the operative risk of these patients. If you see syntax novel or pre combat trial, the syntax score was very low with only two point something uh, compared to daily routine. And um, if we calculate the syntax two um, score on our patient here shown in the beginning of my talk, then we have a logistic euro score of 14 point something percent. And if we uh, have the syntax two score, then this is clearly in favor of PCI. And I hope you all agree that a patient presenting with acute coronary syndrome even if he is suffering from left main disease, is an ideal candidate for PCI and not for cardiac surgery. But what do we have to do to treat this patient uh, um, properly? Um, I would say this is a typical patient that will benefit from intravascular imaging for strategy planning and sizing of the stents. The first step is that we will be able to evaluate the lesion significance. And um, we have many good studies showing that a minimum lumen area of more than six millimeters square in disease left main is safe for a deferral of procedure. And if the cutoff, uh, if the patient has a minimum lumen area below six, then we can go uh, for the procedure. We can characterize our lesion, see severely calcific calcified uh, parts of the vessel, and especially circular parts are uh, something we have to be afraid of because this might mean that we uh, will encounter stent under expansion afterwards. We can evaluate the vessel diameter, lesion length, and um, also can assess the distal reference diameter, which is very important for sizing of our stents um, for the proximal and distal landing zone assessment and to quantify uh, the length of the lesion. And of course, the fourth step could be 
that we assess our implantation quality and um, take a closer look at the stents, especially in the left main for strut malapposition, stent under expansion or edge dissection. And that is something at the end of my talk, I would like to quickly take you through. In this example, in this patient, we um, did IRIS for the LAD and also the CX and of course the left main. As, as you can see here, um, we assess the MLAs of these vessels and regarding um, the minimum lumen areas in the Austin LAD CX and also distal left main, I think you all agree that we have in this case a true complex bifurcation in Medina 111 situation. And um, if we go a little bit further and quantify uh, the lesion here, as shown in the IVIS uh, images, we can see here a properly expanded uh, um, odor stand in the mid LED, but we see here this uh, 360 degree calcium, severely calcified circular, looking like a napkin ring, what might be a little bit complex um, to, uh, um, to um, uh, dilate and maybe we would need a road ablation, uh, a thorectomy or a shockwave in a patient like this. And we clearly see here that um, the distal left main has an uh, um, extensive calcification as well. So these are severe circular calcification that might uh, um, make our um, PCI a little bit more difficult. And then we have to think about the risks of a one stand or two stand strategy in a complex bifurcation like this. And as you know, the risk of a one stand provisional standing is that you can lose the side branch, which would be a cat catastrophe in a left main uh, PCI. But we all know that a suboptimal result increases the risk for stand thrombosis and also for restenosis, as shown here in the picture of the crossroads with uh, uh, many cars. And what we learned um, regarding stenting techniques from the DK Crush 5 trial published from uh, Chinese colleagues four years ago in Jack is that if we have to deal with complex lesions in the left main, then the patients, um, uh, against all our previous experience, then the patient uh, benefit from a two stent strategy. But if we go for two stents, two stents, then they should be implanted in a DK Crush stenting technique double kissing crush technique, so that the distribution of instant restenosis is uh, um, more beneficial for the patient during follow-up as shown here in this uh, um, quick example from the Chinese colleagues. So this is a final result after DK crush stenting in the left main with kissing balloons and final pot. And I would say from a fluoroscopic standpoint, this looks quite nicely. But uh, um, we, as you can imagine, also assess this final result with IVIS and we're, we're happy uh, with the final result for this patient. So let me um, sum up uh, regarding uh, state of the art of left main disease in these days. Um, PCI with new generation drug eluding stents confers to similar outcomes as cabbage in terms of mortality throughout five years. I hope I could convince you uh, regarding this. PCI, as I've shown you, is associated with less periprocedural morbidity regarding stroke, acute kidney injury, major bleeding, and so on. But cabbage is also as associated with better protection from recurrent ischemic events after periprocedural uh, period. Um, this is to say spontaneous myocardial infarction and repeat revascularization. And um, you can call this maybe a better sustainability for the young patient and the diabetic patient when he undergoes cabbage compared to PCI. But as always in, uh, in clinical daily routine, volume outcome relationship, uh, intravascular imaging and the appropriate technique plays an important role for left main PCI. And the same for triple vessel disease. Evidence is growing that mortality for cabbage and PCI with second and even uh, a newer generation DES is quite similar compared to cabbage. The that's uh, the reason why the decision um, about cabbage and PCI should be based on uh, several uh, things. First, the ability to completely revascularize the patient, comorbidities, and um, if the patient is suffering from acute or stable disease, and weighing these short-term risks of death and stroke with cabbage, um, we should think about the long-term benefit, as I told you before, for left main pa patients, uh, reducing the risk of repeat revascularization and myocardial infarction, but something that also has to be discussed is patient's preference 
um, if a patient doesn't want to undergo PCI or cabbage, then we should not force him to. And this can only happen after um, um, counseling um, of the heart team. And something which will elucidate the situation, hopefully a little bit more, will be the FAME 3 trial that uh, is enrolling patient at the moment. And uh, this trial compares an FFR-guided PCI versus angiography-guided cabbage strategy in more than 1,500 patients. This is the end of my talk, and I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, if I'm Uh, Dear Maite, you understand me? You can hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you very well, Wolfgang. I don't hear you. And, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, now you can hear me? Perfect. Uh, wonderful. Okay, perfect overview. It's fantastic. And you are a professional uh, first row. Uh, your title was uh, for the interventional uh, therapy. But since these uh, 10 years, uh, cabbage has also changed in technology. And uh, what is your percentage, just to ask your personal statistics on hard team discussions and on hybrid procedures? Because uh, what is really impressive in uh, my experience right now is uh, that Everything which is done on the beating heart without a uh, heart machine, heart lung machine, is a much, much better outcome. And the uh, mid cap procedure just to take the uh, lima or uh, T graft for uh, expand the right internal uh, mammaria artery for younger patients, at least, and for diabetes patients, is very good procedure without very little risk, what I can see. What is your personal statistical experience with hybrid procedures that uh, if there is a left uh, uh, RCA left or a circumflex artery, which can be easily uh, interventionally treated after cabbage, is that an option for you? Yeah, thank you for this um, very interesting and um, very important question. I mean, first of all, I can stress, and that's something, um, as we are also have a cardiac surgeon in the panel uh, right now, that the cardiac surgeon has become our friends over the last years. So um, thanks to uh, this TAVI movement, I think um, the heart team is not only a definition that not does not exist in, in clinical daily routine. I mean, we really have become friends and are discussing uh, um, our patients and what would be the best strategy. And um, coming back to your question, I would say that a patient with a complex free vessel disease, especially if the patient is suffering from diabetes or even left main, has to be put off the table before going directly to PCI. Because if you ask the patient on the table if he wants to undergo PCI or Uh, uh, would prefer stenotomy. I mean, no patient would, would agree on the table that a stenotomy would be the better way. And um, regarding um, your, your statement about hybrid procedure, I think that is uh, very, very important because this is a very new approach, a new technique. If a patient can, can undergo cardiac surgery with a beating heart, that is very beneficial. The trauma is Uh, uh, less invasive and uh, he will recover um, a lot better uh, after a procedure like this and we can fix these remaining stenosis by P PCI very easily afterwards. Um, something I would like to stress is um, that in recent days it's very important that you know your cardiac surgeon and you discuss with him um, what kind of material he has to use to revascularize uh, the specific patient. And I absolutely agree with you, Wolfgang, that a complete arterial uh, revascular revascularization should be the standard of care in these days, if possible. I mean, if there is a patient uh, uh, that doesn't have any arteries except for the Lima graft, then this can be a, a different story, but uh, complete arterial revascularization should be uh, uh, the gold standard in these days.
Thank you. Yeah, excellent lecture today. Now I would like to um, I'm very happy to meet our, our great friend of Vietnam, Professor Falk. We are very pleased to meet you today. I hope next year I will meet you with Dr. Nguyen in Saigon. Okay. Okay, well, now I would like to introduce Professor Falk talking about octopus surgery. Thank you for coming with us. Okay, can you can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. Just a moment, but I cannot. And can you see my presentation? No, not yet. A lot of uh, slides. Okay, okay now. Not yet? Yes, you uh, are. Now you can see it now. Now you can see it. Yeah. Um. No. Can you see now the presentation? Everything. I can see. The yes, we can see. I, I hear you clearly. Okay, but you can see the presentation as well. Or yeah. no? Yes, we can see. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, Professor Nguyen, Professor Win, thank you very much for uh, kind the invitation to this webinar. Of course, um, we have met many times uh, in Vietnam, and I, I hope to be back maybe next year or so. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to to see you and to meet you again. Um, even though just by uh, Zoom technology, I would also like uh, uh, to say hello to all um, all the colleagues of this meeting. So the task I was asked for to talk about aortic surgery. Um, I will show you um, some patients or some technology, some ideas how to perform cardiac surgery, some patients at the end, two slides about the current results and the indication for aortic surgery. Aortic surgery certainly is dynamic and is challenging. And here you can see it, uh, this is the, the greatest catastrophe which you can find in aortic surgery. It's one of the few true emergency still in cardiovascular surgery um, that is acute um, type A dissection. Um, uh, acute type A dissection, you can see a very old uh, slide here from the 70s. This is the mortality rate in unoperated type A dissection. You can see most uh, there is a pericardial tamponade which will kill the patient and the mortality rate is 2% per hour. And even though this is a quite old uh, slide, it's still true. Uh, so without uh, cardiac surgery, only 95% of patients probably will survive. This is um, from the Gerada registry. These are the data about the cumulative mortality rate, which you can compare if you treat type A or B uh, dissection uh, medically. There are some patients uh, which, can, which are quite inoperable and you with type A dissection who do not have pericardial tamponade or aortic insufficiency or cardiogenic shock, but um, the sites are inoperable or uh, from neurological complications does not make any sense. And so you can see here, it's quite clear that for type A dissection, surgery uh, still is a life-saving procedure. And you um, will see the numbers about uh, this operation. Now, how, I, how are we doing? If um, there is a patient with type beta section coming in our hospital, we go from the ambulance directly into the operating room. We don't do coronary angiography. We have done in a few patients, mostly in older patients, where in the CT scan we have seen heavy calcifications um, in the coronary arteries, but um, associated or necessary simultaneous coronary surgery is very, very rare. So we go to the OR, to a TEE, and sometimes transthoracic echocardiography, it does suffice, and um, then we start surgery. A CT scan today, okay, the CT scan takes a few minutes to, to be done uh, close to the operating room. You can do that, but basically uh, it is not uh, an absolute necessity. What is most important is if the patient uh, does show any malperfusion already before surgery. This might be a visceral or renal or above all neurological malperfusion. And you can see that the survival is strongly related to already preoperative existing malperfusion. Before surgery, as a surgeon, you have to check uh, if the patient has palpable pulses. 
in the groin, of course, in the carotid arteries, in the radial arteries, you have to have a look on the neurological deficit. And if the patient arrives with an increasing blood lactate level, uh, with a lack of one groin pulse, and maybe in anuria, uh, this is a high index of suspicion for visceral malperfusion. In these patients, you take them, of course, on the table. Uh, you are ready with the heart-lung machine, uh, but today you first do a laparotomy, and you should check if there is visceral renal malperfusion, particularly visceral malperfusion. And you uh, may first, before you are addressing the ascending aorta, usually we do um, an infrarenal removal of the dissection membrane to assure um, the visceral perfusion also during and after surgery. You can see this uh, was one patient who has a complete rupture of the intima media uh, from the ascending aorta and the aortic arch. It was pushed by the bloodstream forward distally to the left subclavian artery. And co of course, this was like uh, uh, the thoracic descending thoracic aorta has been clamped um, after the left the origin of the left subclavian artery and the patient had a total um, stop of the circulation of the lower part of the body and uh, died in multi-organ failure after surgery. So if you have a normal patient, normal neurology, normal perfusion, and you wean him from bypass, again, you have to look if there is a new lack of groin pulse after weaning from bypass, because uh, again, after surgery, rising lactate level and um, anuria or oliguria um, and the lack of one groin pulse may indicate visceral renal malperfusion. There you have two options, catheter intervention, it's quite fast. If it is quite fast and if you have staff in your hospital, otherwise you proceed to laparotomy and uh, you do a surgical fenestration of the infrarenal aorta. It's uh, clear that type A dissection, you treat the dissection of the intrapericardial part of the ascending aorta to prevent tamponade and death. Then you have to uh, address small perfusion, the aortic regurgitation. You excise the primary tear, which might be in the ascending aorta, in the arch, or uh, you might not find any tear at all, but you replace uh, the ascending aorta. There is a huge debate what kind of surgery is necessary. Um, should you do a composite graft? Should you do a supra coronary graft and um, preserve? Um, a nice tricuspid aortic valve, should you do a Tyron David? And uh, this does not cha change the results, but uh, the main question is also what to do with the aortic arch. And in some surgeons replace routinely the aortic arch entire and revascularize uh, the head and neck vessels. But in acute type A dissection, if the patient is arriving in cardiogenic shock or with severe aortic regurg, I guess that the minimal amount of uh, surgery which is necessary to address the main problem um, has the lowest mortality and morbidity. So there is no need, particularly because patients are older today, to do excessive art surgery if this is not necessary. Of course, there is an open distal anastomosis to the aortic arch, but I guess there must be a clear indication to replace the entire aortic arch. So this is the surgeon's task to correct, uh, do a correct surgical procedure to restore the organ perfusion and to intraoperatively address the adequacy of the body perfusion. And complete surgery means you have to continue surgery until all problems with regard to malperfusion are solved. Um, sometimes you can solve additional problems interventionally, as mentioned, if you have time and if you have the staff. And um, you have to be quite aware that uh, any kind of malperfusion, a myonecrosis, like even a myonecrosis because of an ischemic leg with a subsequent renal failure due to rhabdomyolysis may postoperatively kill the patient. So in my opinion, it's a uh, type beta section is the, is the main task. It's a, a typical task and uh, for, for the surgeon and he must be able to decide everything before and during surgery. What we still are uh, noting and many, miss, many patients in whom the diagnosis have been missed, it's quite clear it's chest pain, maybe similar to angina, but it's radiating and it's wandering along the vascular tree to the neck and to the intrascapular pain. Malperfusion is very important. You can just have uh, the left uh, uh, 
uh, food, which is white and pulseless, and this can be indicative for type A dissection. So if you have a chest problem and you have a peripheral vascular problem acutely, there is one disease, and this is called acute type A dissection. Of course, uh, many patients, um, they have a suspicion first of acute myocardial infarction, and then they have the secondary diagnosis of dissection, and then they arrive with aspirin, clopidogrel, or with even more aggressive anticoagulation. And uh, we had even some patients who had uh, uh, these NOAX. And so the, the problems for cardiac surgery with regard to uh, emergency surgery for acute uh, B dissections has not become uh, uh, less severe, but uh, all these uh, thrombocyte um, aggregation inhibitors and particularly the NOAC, they uh, pose a, a great problem for us as cardiac surgeons. By contrast to type A, type B dissection usually is not an indication for emergency surgery, except these five indications, a free rupture, a malperfusion, whereas you are correcting, uh, you make a local correction of the malperfusion. As an example, if you have malperfusion of the left leg, you don't address the thoracic aorta, but you do a femoral femoral uh, vascular graft to assure uh, correct perfusion of the left leg. You may have a pseudocoarctation, persisting pain, paraparesis, or hematothorax. These are indications for our indications for acute um, emergency surgery for um, acute type B dissection. Otherwise, it's a disease which is treated either medically or by endovascular management. But you can see here, um, the surgical management, uh, unnecessary surgical management in acute diabetes dissection has a high mortality rate. It's not indicated. You have to wait. The, the disease will become chronic. And if there is a post-dissection aneurysm with a diameter more than 6.5 centimeter, uh, then it will be either surgical or it will be for endovascular management. But um, in the acute phase, there is either endovascular or medical. The results so far are about the same between both techniques. So this so far for emergency surgery of the ascending aorta and type E dissection. And here you can see another topic is um, the aneurysm of the ascending aorta. On the left side, this is a 29-year-old Marfan patient. On the right side, this is an 86-year-old, 80, in the upper is an 86-year-old uh, female patient uh, with an ascending aortic aneurysm. And in the lower right, again, you can see a typical aneurysm of a young Marfan patient. There are different options are available. Supracommissural replacement with or without hemiarch, total arch replacement, or any kind of... Uh, uh, reconstruction of the head and neck vessels. And also, of course, what you can do, you can put in an elephant trunk uh, for further surgery on the descending thoracic aorta. Another option also is valve preserving surgery. There are mainly three types of surgery. One is Tyron David operation. The second one is the Jakob operation. And the third one is the Florida sleeve operation. It's a newer technique uh, where you leave the aortic root with the sinotobular junction and the coronary arteries in situ, and you put a prosthesis around uh, the intact aortic root, and the prosthesis is anchored at the aortic root, similar to the Tyron David operation. So this is uh, then the extreme uh, way of um, addressing ascending aortic, proximal descending, and arch surgery with re-implantation of the head and neck vessel. So there are, as mentioned, um, you can replace or repair the aortic valve. Um, you can use a mechanical or a bioprosthesis. And the distal anastomosis can be uh, in the ascending aorta uh, with cross clamp and without circulatory arrest. You can replace uh, the entire aortic arch, or you can even go to the descending aorta. With regard to Tyron David operation, the problem still of the Tyron David operation is that we do not really know about what, what are the long term results uh, of the Tyron David operation. And as there are five different types of David, David, oper, Tyron David operation, and we don't know really how to measure the size of the graft, uh, it is uh, an operation which is which probably should be done more often, uh, but 
as there are five different techniques available, um, this does tell us that something still is uh, not completely evaluated in this surgical technique. Uh, personally, if possible, I use the Florida sleeve upper operation maybe you have never seen that there is one group of course in florida we had we just done a lot of cases and they report an operation free survival for 10 years of 99 percent so for me this is a easier and promising technique here you can see a picture of a thoraco abdominal replacement of the thoraco abdominal aorta the head is on the right side, and you can see here the revascularization of the visceral vessel and of the renal arteries, and this is the, so to say, the infrarenal part. And um, of course, surgery for the descending thoracic and for the abdominal aorta has changed a lot with endovascular treatment. Nevertheless, there are still patients which need open surgery, and these are mainly the Marfan patients. And there has been a concept considerable evolution of the approach and the problems which uh, are still available are um, ischemia and malperfusion during or after surgery and there are two points paraplegia and renal failure and the problem um, is if you are going to climb proximally there is a huge increase of cardiac afterload there is an increase of blood pressure and there is a massive increase of cardiac uh, of the cardiac work whereas below you have uh, ischemia which of course worsens with extended clamp time and after ischemia you have a reperfusion injury which is aggravated if uh, it's not dry if it does continue to bleed and if the patient has um, uh, a intraoperative or postoperative hypotension these are the types of thoracoabdominal surgery, which varies by the extent, of course, of the aneurysm and the repair, which is necessary. This is the approach, how we do this open, uh, open repair of the thoracoabdominal aorta. This is how the patient is positioned. Uh, here you can see the thoracoabdominal incision. You have to, uh, to cut the diaphragm. And then you have an access from the left subclavian uh, to the aortic bifurcation. What is important is that um, during the clamp time, you should avoid any kind of, of, of ischemia. And um, you can use different cannula and you have continued perfusion of the renal arteries and the visceral arteries. Because the patients have become older, undergoing uh, descending thoracic or abdominal aortic surgery is important, in my opinion, to avoid ischemia during surgery. And uh, of course, what you can do with or uh, with cardiopulmonary bypass with and without hypodermic circulatory arrest. Personally, I do this kind of surgery always cardiopulmonary bypass, but try to avoid any kind of uh, malperfusion and like to have continued visceral renal perfusion during surgery. So as you can see here. What I um, has found to be quite important is uh, this cerebrospinal fluid drainage. In my opinion, is uh, it's one technology which has markedly uh, decreased the incidence of postoperative uh, paraplegia. Uh, the evening before, uh, you put the needle into the to, to drain the spinal cord fluid. And then you measure during surgery, during your cross clamping, there should be less than 15 millimeter uh, mercury pressure inside. And you are going to drain maximum up to one or 1.5 liter during surgery. You leave this drainage until 24 to 48 hours after surgery. If you remove uh, the drainage, let's say after 24 hours after surgery and the patient starts to show sign of paraparesis or paraplegia, uh, you reinsert uh, the cerebrospinal fluid drainage, and you can, uh, and paraparesis and even paraplegia uh, can recover. There are minor complications possible if you do excessive cerebrospinal fluid drainage, like intracranial hemorrhage or headache, of course, meningitis or epidural abscess. But personally, I've fortunately I have never ex uh, experienced uh, that kind of complication. Okay, I will go over this. This is all about uh, cerebral spinal fluid drainage. 
Uh, the other way to do that, this is Nicolas Kuchukos. Uh, he uses always profound hypothermic circulatory arrest and is replacing the entire thoracoabdominal aorta uh, in deep hypothermia. And his results are about similar to those published uh, with a, a low, lower or less hypothermia and the use of cardiopulmonary bypass without circulatory arrest. So I will show you because uh, aortic search is a dynamic um, is a dynamic field. You can see here what we see patients with severe atherosclerotic disease of the ascending aorta and the arch, which have either anticoagulation or thrombocyte, thrombocyte inhibitors, but continue uh, to do ischemic, transient ischemic episodes or, or even minor strokes. And in these patients, uh, we started to do a thrombendarterectomy of the ascending aorta and of the aortic arch. And we, measure, we close the adventitia. And then over the next three to five years, we check the patient by MRI and could see that um, the ascending aorta and the arch of the thrombendarterectomy of this calcific material remain stable. Another group of patients um, are patients with recur recurrent coarctation. Of course, coarctation uh, nowadays is treated mostly by stenting. Nevertheless, there are some patients um, who had been operated uh, once, who had been operated twice, and to go back into the left chest would mean a complex re-operation. -re and there are particularly patients who have a bicuspid aortic valve, and coarctation and an ascending aortic aneurysm. And in these patients, it's a very elegant solution if you do an extra anatomic bypass from the ascending aorta to the abdominal aorta just proximal to the celiac trunk. You can see here one um, child we have operated on. This child, the perfusion of the lower body of this child came about the uh, circle of Willisi because she had no uh, aortic arch and she had severe the hypertension of the of the upper body and of course massive ventricular dilatation and uh, in this child we did also surgery from the ascending aorta uh, to the supraceliac aorta to restore normal perfusion another um, disease is this traumatic aortic rupture still also um, has become mainly a topic for uh, endovascular uh, technology and traumatic aortic rupture associated uh, with brain trauma or so uh, sometimes can have delayed surgery or even delayed uh, treatment with an AVAR. This has also changed with regard to open surgery. Still traumatic are aortic infections um, and prosthetic infections and mycotic aneurysm, which I can show you one. Here is the head. This is the diaphragm. And this is, my, this is a mycotic aneurysm of the distal descending thoracic aorta with pneumococci. Here you can see a mycotic aneurysm which, which ruptured into the left lung and the patient survived because of this clot. And this was a mycotic aneurysm which ruptured into the esophagus and into the lung. So we published a series and, uh, of about 75 patients and compared the use of cryopreserved arteries compared to standard technology and um, could achieve similar results as with uh, elective surgery for these cases. i so show you another uh, um, particular patient, 64-year-old patient. He had 25 years ischemic heart disease, then had an LVAT, got heart transplantation, and four weeks after heart transplantation, so he was sent with sternum dehiscence and sternum osteomyelitis, you can see here. And he had a mycotic aneurysm of the ascending aorta with impending rupture of the aorto-aortic anastomosis and um, an infected, um, infected prosthetic part of the arterial return was in place. Uh, when we opened the chest, we could find this. And the question was, what, what is this? Is it hylothorax? Is it infection? Is it fatty degeneration? Or what should it be? And what we have found in this patient after transplantation, uh, this was Aspergillus fumigatus. And uh, we, we did treat these patients with chlorhexidine. Uh, we had open chest treatment with vacuum-assisted drainage. And we just did the 
entire chest bath and chlorhexidine several times until the microbiology has been negative. We put in a latissimus dorsi muscle flap uh, on the left chest to eliminate the cavity from the, the previous elbow and uh, close the sternum in routine fashion and still the patient now has a seven year follow up uh, and is still quite healthy. So it's a, a rare case of post transplant Aspergillus fumigatus infection, uh, which has survived. This is another patient who had a composite graft arch replacement and who had also an elephant trunk for the descending aorta. And he has, he has in, an infection with so-called Mycobacterium chimere. Maybe you heard that Mycobacterium chimere originated from the air of the heater cooler in the operating theater. Um, and this has been found um, as a new infectious disease and has been eliminated when the heater cooler uh, machine for the heart-lung machine has been placed outside the operating room. And several patients have been identified in Europe and uh, in America with this kind of infection. But um, I guess so far this problem has been eliminated. But here we did send this material here to microbiology. It does, was in 100%. This was Mycobacterium chimera. Of course, all these um, infected graft has been removed and pre replaced uh, by other kind of foreign material. We already heard about hybrid treatment. You can see here a typical Marfan patient who had already five or six times surgery, and uh, he came back with this aneurysm. And in this patient, we replaced uh, the ascending aorta, did a composite graft, re-implanted the head and neck vessels, replaced the arch kept the patient, uh, did an elephant trunk, and kept the patient in hospital uh, to, to put in uh, a descending thoracic graft into the elephant trunk. And so the patient has been discharged home um, after 20 days. Um, so a combination of extensive aortic surgery together uh, with endovascular treatment. Of course, if you have thoracoabdominal aneurysm, the other way to do it today, or if you have an aortic aneurysm, suprarenal and intranenal, that you can do this visceral renal debranching. This is a, a good hybrid treatment. We put a bifurcation process connected to one and the other renal artery, and then two other arms to the uh, superior mesentery, ericardi, and the celiac trunk, and then you are free to stand either the entire abdominal aorta, or you can even stand the entire thoracoabdominal aorta. This, is, this can be done over a median laparotomy, for a thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm instead of this huge thoracoabdominal incision. The same is possible for an ascending aortic and arch aneurysm. If you have an arch aneurysm, you can debranch all the vessels. You put it on a bifurcation process from the ascending aorta. And in the same procedure, you can do stenting of the distal part of the ascending aorta and the arch. Uh, and this does not necessitate any arch replacement with a uh, hypodermic circulatory arrest. Here you can see on intraoperative pictures uh, about visceral renal translocation uh, with four legs going to both renal arteries to the mesenteric, uh, superior mesenteric artery and uh, to the celiac trunk. There, uh, here you see a picture of a chronic type A dissection. Um, this is a patient we have operated with the foundation in Myanmar, a young man here, which had the typical chronic type A dissection. In these countries, as you know, um, not all patients with acute type A dissections get surgery. And this is the tip of the iceberg of young patients who survive acute type B dissection and uh, develop a post-dissection aortic aneurysm. There are other surgeries we have done with Eurasia Heart Foundation, like uh, uh, a coarctation and a distal aneurysm. We had repaired this also a patient from Myanmar with reimplantation of the left subclavian artery. And uh, this is a special patient who had a mycotic aneurysm of the infrarenal aorta. You can see here, we ruptured into the spine. In this patient also, we had to stabilize uh, uh, the spine. 
So aortic surgery, this was an aneurysm after the Ross operation in a young lady. It was the first redo. And you can see sometimes reoperation in coronary surgery can be quite tricky, particularly if you find a situation here, as an example, like the, the right coronary artery here uh, is very close, of course, uh, to this uh, sternal wire. This was a young man, also very particular, I have never seen before. This patient had a, a high-speed uh, accident and he had rupture of the ascending aorta here. Rupture of the ascending aorta, you can see it here, but he survived because the adventitia surrounding the ascending aorta and the pulmonary artery together um, was not ruptured and he developed a huge aneurysm and he was operated on with the replacement of the ascending aorta, but this is a rare case of a young patient who survived the traumatic rupture of the ascending aorta. So you can see there are very complex situations in aortic surgery. These are the current mortality rates, abdominal aortic aneurysm elective, 0.5% mortality, emergent if it's ruptured and you need surgery, cannot be treated by AVAR, 5 to 10% mortality, elective surgery of the ascending aorta with or without valve or cabbage or arch, has a 0.5% mortality, type A dissection 5%, elective descending thoracic or 5%, thoraco uh, in rupture emergent 10%, and thoraco abdominal aortic surgery still has a mortality rate of 5 to 10%. We have done a series uh, of about 28 patients with hybrid treatment for arch and thoraco abdominal, and uh, so far have been lucky not to have um, any mortality. So the results improved in aortic surgery. This is quite clear. Mortality decreased and morbidity decreased, particularly with regard to neurological complications. Combined surgery is feasible, of course, and stent and hybrid treatment is quite welcome. And prophylactic surgery um, is a hot topic in aortic surgery and should be carried out according to recommended diameters. And here you can see in the ascending aorta, usually if, it's if it is tricuspid aortic valve, the indication for an atherosclerotic aneurysm is 5.5 centimeter. For tissue deficiency syndrome or bicuspid aortic valve, it's 4.5 centimeter if there is a positive family history. Otherwise, it's 5 centimeter. Aortic arch, 5.5 to 6 centimeters. And descending thoracic aorta, 6 centimeter. If it's post dissection aorta, 6.5. And infrarenal aortic aneurysm still is 5 centimeter. Okay, so again, thank you very much um, for this uh, invitation to present something about uh, aortic surgery. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Of, uh, excellent lecture. Uh, I hope to see you next year uh, in our city. Okay, thank Not you very much, person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For the next talk, I would okay. like to introduce Dr. Stefan Winter. Mr. Winter. Yeah. yeah, hello, the colleagues. So I'm very happy to have the chance to give a talk here about the lethal device therapy and the question, is it a new state of the art or back to the future? So we'd go to the history of lethal pacing and then uh, I'll show you the specific uh, details of intracardiac pacemakers and the uh, subcutaneous ICD. I think you all know this, that the history of uh, pacemakers started in 1958 in Stockholm with the first uh, implantation in human. And um, this is nearly the same for the ICD with the first prototype here with uh, Mura and Marowski in 1980. And then we had a development of the ICD therapy through the years, uh, starting from an abdominal approach uh, to the transvenous over the dual chamber and the CRTD we have today. And then in uh, 2010, first time we had an ICD without any leads. So without any leads in the body or in the heart was a subcutaneous ICD. Why is there a need for devices without any um, leads? I think it's quite obvious because we have three big points. These are the pocket associated complications like infection or hematoma. 
the lead associated complications you all know with lead fractures, thrombosis, uh, tricuspid valve uh, insufficiency. And I think there's more and more upcoming uh, the demand of the patient, which do not want to have any restrictions like uh, scars or a reminding uh, of their disease. So I think we have enough points to make to develop something without any leads. Um, there's a nice overview of the complications of the pacemaker therapy, as you can see here. And most of the problems we had was associated with the leads we implanted. And this is quite the same for the ICD devices, as you can see here. It's a follow-up of uh, more than 900 patients over 10 years. And as you can see in this uh, graph, um, if you go through the years, there is an upcoming of lead fracture, for example, here with up to 20% if you have a longevity of 10 years of the leads. As you can see here in the kaplan meyer curve, um, through the years, um, the, the probability that the patient will suffer from any problems from the leads is uh, upcoming more and more. So these all um, made us, or not us, but uh, our friends before, uh, working on the requirement to a new pacemaker system, for example. So what do we need? We need a miniaturization of the pacemaker. We need a percutaneous transvenous intracardiac implantation without any leads from the pocket to the heart. But we do not want to give away our status quo we have with all the um, positive signs of, of pacemaking the battery longevity, the MRT, um, compatibility, the rate response, all these things we did not want to um, give apart. So at the end, to uh, cut the long story short, we want all the advantages we have in the pacemaker therapy in this new technology, but without any leads and obliges devices. So I think it's uh, quite normal that the first uh, thinking about the therapy started, as you can see here, in 1970, so over 50 years ago. And it ended up in uh, 2015 in the first uh, micro device from the um, company Medtronic, which is implanted in the heart. You can see here all the figures. I do not want uh, to go these figures uh, with you. And uh, we have since 2020, we have the next generation of the micro device it's a micro AV which has the possibility to get some signals from the atrium and to to do an um, AV conducted uh, pacing so I think this is quite clear you see here the normal transvenous pacemaker and the little micro but what I want to focus on is the um, accelerometer I think we have to talk about because you have something in the heart which is moving the whole time. And uh, so you, you um, have to make sure that the pacemaker is um, getting the point that the patient is moving and uses the accelerometer and um, the, the kind of fixation. So we have no screw leads, we have uh, flexible tines in the micro as I will show you later. And this is a technical comparison of the micro AV and the micro VR. I just show you that it's uh, outside the same device with a little bit changed software and a changed hardware, but outside it's completely the same. And also the implantation mode is uh, the same as we know it from the micro VR. This is a delivery catheter. You can see here the micro at the top of the catheter. And this is the introducer. It's a uh, um, 23 French inner diameter with 27 outside. Um, so I think everyone who is um, familiar with um, EP or with any um, device implantation um, knows these uh, tools to handle. And you have the delivery catheter I will show you later. And this is a fixation mode I told you. These are these tines which um, are loaded here in the capsule of the catheter. And if you pull back this one, it's uh, doing like a, a, a breast swimming movement and it's uh, deeping in the, the myocardium and it's fixated here. So you should um, be aware that there are two times fixated. Let me very shortly, uh, shortly show you the new development of the micro um, AV. It's using the accelerometer I just showed you not only to get the regulation of the air mode, but it's also now um, sensing the atrial contraction. 
you know, these are the um, different uh, times in the heart with the beginning of the systole, the end of the systole, the E-wave and the A-wave. And um, you have to make sure that the device is trying to get these uh, A-wave to, to get a signal here, which is um, shown like this, to know that there's a contraction of the atrium. And then there's a uh, pacing of the, of the right ventricle just to get an AV synchrony. This is a new programmer surface. You will see them with um, new markers. You have to, yeah, you have to get to know where it's shown that there's a kind of uh, end of blanking time, um, which allows the new device to, to get the contraction mode of the atrium. And then there's these um, uh, ventricular pacing, as you know, from the other devices. If we talk about the study data for the MICRA device, we have uh, different uh, studies and big registries. And up to now, we have more than um, 3,000 patients with a follow-up of more than three years in the study. So in real life, we have a follow-up of up to five years, which uh, completely um, yeah, supports these data we get from the studies, which I show you now. We have a stable electrical performance of more than 12 months now. As you can see, there's no um, decrease um, or increase in, in threshold. There's uh, a very stable A wave and impedance. And I think very important is that after these 12 months in the studies, we had a calculated battery longevity of 12.1 years. And what are the, about the major complications? You can see this here. It's a very confusing um, diagram, but I want to focus you on this that after the time of, uh, uh, of six months, there's only a very few complications. So it's completely different from that, what we know from, from other pacemaker systems where a screw maybe work through the myocardium through the months, through the first months. So the only complications we had in this time after 30 days or six months was the developing of heart failure due to the permanent right ventricular pacing, which we know also from the transvenous systems. And I think we have to keep this in mind. So there's a very low complication rate for the micro procedure and uh, nearly no complications after the initial implantation, apart from this, what I show, uh, have shown you, the uh, um, developing of uh, cardiac heart failure. So the registry data um, supported this data from the big micro study and we had a, a, a nearly 100 successful implantation rate with a complication rate, which is uh, going down through the years, through the studies, through the registry, and ends up here by 2%, for example. A very interesting finding of this um, registries and the um, data of the big study was the comparison to an, a matched group of transvenous VVI patients, as you can see here. And um, if you have a closer look to this, you see a risk reduction compared to the transvenous system and the micra of 63%. Of course, there's 82% in uh, system revision. Uh, this uh, yeah, is, is quite normal because you will not um, do a revision on a micra as easy as you do it uh, on a transvenous pacemaker system. But in the end, I think we have a risk reduction and uh, this is totally clear and was supported by other findings in, in registries and real life data, which I can show you here. You can see here the micro ID study and the post market re registry, and then the data from our um, Cologne colleagues, which we did with the University of Cologne. And you see um, the, the complication rate is going down through the years. I think it uh, depends on the kind of uh, learning curve and which is quite important, I think, is uh, we have no infection which uh, require a device removement, uh, which is, yeah, I think totally outstanding. So I just want to show you these data from uh, our own cohort. You can see here the, the study data uh, from the MicroID study and uh, the gray line is uh, our line from the St. Vincent's Hospital uh, where uh, Dr. Din Kuang Nien and me are implanting the devices and now we have the Micra AV, the new device uh, with a follow up up to six months where we can see the same effect. Uh, I told you before that the threshold is very stable, um, also the sensing and the impedance. And I think this is quite important, this, uh, the battery longevity, which is always uh, asked for. 
Um, this is in our total cohort. We have now um, a battery longevity of uh, 13 years. So as you can see here, we have uh, the follow-up months and then we, we have a look at the remaining time of the device. And so we can calculate the, the average battery longevity. And even for the patients with uh, AV node uh, ablation, for example, which have a stimulation rate of more than 59%, we have 12 years um, of battery longevity. And I think this is uh, yeah, quite nice for a new device. So very shortly, this is the Marvel 2 study. This was the only study which was done through the um, micro-AV algorithm. I think in the matter of time, I would not like to go into detail of this uh, algorithm, but uh, this study just has shown that you can achieve uh, AV synchrony in the study um, of up to 86%. This is our flowchart we, um, uh, we prepared in the Vincent's Hospital which we can go just through and um, yeah, can uh, remind us if we want to uh, implant a DDD system, so a transvenous system or a micro uh, VI or RV. So uh, there are some pros and cons you have to think about if you think about the micro. Um, I think in the matter of time, I will not go through all these pros and cons. Of course, the, the important pros are uh, renal insufficiency, um, any kind of uh, malignant uh, diseases or no venous access. But I think there are more and more things which may support us to implant a micro. What's about the subcutaneous ICD? Um, for all these who know the device, um, the device is here on the left side of the body. Then there is a subcutaneous um, lead, which is going up to the sternum. And you have um, then a shock between the box and the, and the lead. And you have a sensing between these three poles so that you have three possibilities of sensing. You have an uh, 80 joule uh, shock of the device and um, a loading time of nine seconds. And the battery longevity at the moment is about seven to eight years. It's implanted between the musculus serratus and the musculus latissimus so that you can even hide it in very uh, small patients. I think this is quite interesting to see the surface uh, ECG or the ECG, which is um, get by the subcutaneous ICD. This is very similar in uh, form to the surface uh, ECG. And this is um, yeah, something else than in the transvenous pacemakers, as you can see here, the intracardiac uh, EGM. So that the device is getting a surface ECG, as you know it from the 12 channel ECG. This is a study data of the subcutaneous ICD. Um, I will not go through all the studies with you in, in detail. I think the START study was a very important study at the beginning because it showed in comparison, as you can see here, to all the other companies and device uh, companies with single chamber or dual chamber, that they have a very high sensitivity in the new device. Um, and even the specificity was better than we know it from the other um, uh, ICD devices. So this was a start study and the beginning, uh, at least, of the uh, um, subcutaneous ICD upcoming in the market. In the next years, there were more and more um, um, studies which were, or registry, which were um, com comparing the subcutaneous ICD um, versus um, transvenous ICD. And I think the main facts are here. So it were five retrospective studies with more than 2,000 patients in the subcutaneous ICD and more than 5,000 in the transvenous ICD um, uh, groups. And they are all were regarding to lead failure, infection, and inappropriate therapy. And these meta-analyses, they showed that the subcutaneous ICD, of course, is much better in the fact of lead failure. Um, there was no difference in infection. Uh, device failure, there was no significant difference. Uh, the inappropriate therapy was both in both group, uh, was uh, similar in both groups. Um, even the um, inappropriate therapy due to um, the supraventricular tachycardia were more in the um, transvenous um, ICD groups. And we had uh, an oversensing which lead to inappropriate ther therapy more in the subcutaneous ICD. 
But I think the, the very important trial we, we got was um, in 2020, the, um, the Praetorian uh, trial with more than 800 patients and a uh, uh, head-to-head -head comparison of uh, SICD and transvenous ICDs, as you can see here, regarding complications and inappropriate therapy. You can hear the baseline um, characteristics here which is uh, the normal ICD population, even uh, ischemic and non-ischemic, secondary and primary prevention. So the total group of ICD. And this study, the first time showed in a head-to-head -head comparison that the subcutaneous ICD is not inferior to the transvenous ICD. And I think this was very important for all us implanting devices because um, up to this point, the subcutaneous ICD was uh, a kind of... Uh, yeah, device for, for very special patients. And, and now we, we know that we can use it um, even for primary or secondary prevention and not only for a very small group, but we have to keep in mind the, um, the restrictions of the device, like uh, there's no um, pacing, you can do no um, ATP, but um, it showed the first time that it is similar to the transvenous system. I don't know if this will really change um, that what you can see here in Germany, the, the ICD implantations, as you can see here for the VVI system transvenous and the subcutaneous ICD in the years uh, 2015 to 2017. It was a very small group of subcutaneous ICDs and I think we uh, all have to look up if there's uh, an increasing number in the next years. The guidelines, they uh, just uh, had it in their guidelines with a 2A declaration and even in the new uh, rec recommendation of the ERA, there is, um, it's mentioned uh, especially for patients which had problems with uh, devices before that we should think about the um, micra and the subcutaneous ICD. Again, we have a flowchart for this in the uh, St. Vincent's Hospital just to um, make sure that we fit the right device for the right patient. And it's not as easy as it uh, might be, but you have to think about some points and then I hope we get the right decision. This will be the future. So we are all looking for a combination of the subcutaneous ICD with a leadless um, antibiotic pacing system. They are first results in, in animal studies that this will work, but we don't know when it will be the first implantation in human, but we are all waiting for this. So let me conclude. We have an uh, intracardiac pacemaker with a high rate of successful implantation with uh, um, meeting all the long-term safety endpoints. We have a very low complication uh, risk with um, decreasing complication rates um, through the years. We have a very good stable electrical performance and a battery longevity of 12 to 13 years. And the subcutaneous ICD is uh, proven to be safe and easy to implant. And after the Praetorian uh, trial, the subcutaneous ICD is more than an alternative to a transvenous ICD system. So just to answer the question you, you gave me in my talk is uh, the leadless device therapy, new state of the art or back to the future, I think. Needless device therapy is just the beginning of the future. And we all as implanters um, have it in our hands to, to make this new technology um, very successful. So thank you very much. And um, I would like to close this talk with a picture of the first um, implantation of the micro AV in Germany with uh, Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Jan Malte Zinning here. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan for your excellent presentation. And um, Stefan Winter is really my really uh, good friend in our hospital. And um, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me to work with him uh, uh, the whole day in the hospital. And um, are there some questions? Maybe Professor Lemke, a short question to Lidley Spacing, Professor Lemke. Yes. yes, I have a final question. Um, in the concept of leadless pacing, um, I'm missing the concept um, of physiological pacing. So I want to ask the question um, uh, to, to uh, Stefan Winter. 
um, what will be the future in pacing? Will it be a conduction system pacing or will it really um, uh, leadless pacing? Or is there a possibility to combine the both uh, concepts? Okay, good question. Um, I'm totally sorry that I did not hear your talk. I was just moving from your uh, hometown or near your hometown from the Sauerland uh, to Cologne because I, I visited my mom. Um, but back to your question. So I think it's not quite easy to answer because we have two technologies and we have a very good old technology with the transvenous system. I do not want to abandon. I think it's a very good technology we have in the, the Micra. We have to keep in mind the restrictions. I did not go to all the restrictions. I think the main restriction is the, the age because we, we should not implant it uh, in a 60-year-old uh, patient who will um, have a lot of pacing, for example, where I would take the, the his bundle pacing. Of course, the combination would be the, the best thing with the reloading of the battery. This would be perfect, Yeah, but I think up to this, we have to work a lot. Um, so I think there will be the, the place for both um, technologies and the, the his bundle pacing, or it's now called the conduction system pacing. I think it's just moving because, um, and this is quite interesting because it moved from the, the selective to the non-selective his bundle pacing. And now we are at the conduction system pacing. I don't know how this future uh, looks like. There, there, there are no so big studies about this. We have to um, wait for this. If so, what's about the threshold? What's about the longevity of the leads? But I think at the moment, these both products can work, um, yeah, belong together because we have different groups where we will uh, fit it in. Okay. Thank you very much. And at the end, I want to uh, please Professor Dr. Wing to share the closing remarks of our symposium. We, we intend to ask you to talk about closing remarks. Okay, I am very happy to have this meeting this year uh, because of COVID. We cannot meet each other there in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. We hope in the next year you can meet all of you. I think that's this, uh, this symposium. We can study, we can have this, uh, so many things for us. It is very useful, right? So many of our colleagues would like to ask you if they can have some of your lecture uh, today. I don't know if you agree, I will, you can have the lecture for our young colleague in Vietnam. So uh, we, we hope in the future we will have, since I think that we have cooperation between the German Vietnamese Society of uh, cardiology and Ho Chi Minh City Cardiology Society for more than 20 years. I hope we have continued to do this to help our young doctor in Vietnam. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. We would like to talk something. <laughs> okay, I, 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 I think the the symposium was fantastic. I, I thank Professor Wynn and United um, International Pharma very much for, the, for everything. Many thanks uh, to our speaker today. Those were very interesting lectures. We should know it more often. Many thanks to our listeners. I hope that you can take something home from this symposium. Thank you for everything. Goodbye. <laughs>